a tough moment was in the Alps. You know, we're climbing. We just finished our biggest climb, and my uh, my special needs bag was gone. So my nutrition that I planned to have for the second part of the bike was gone. And so I was really like, oh boy, I was freaking out. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll never forget it. This little French woman had me. She had a hoagie, and she said. In, in French, I don't even know what she said. She just offered it to me. She tore off the bottom third, kept it for her, and then gave me two thirds for a sandwich. Oh. And so that was, I mean, that was my nutrition wow. for it. the second half of the bike was, was a hope. Have you ever heard the phrase becoming the best version of yourself? Yeah, me too. But what does that even mean? And how do we become that person? I'm here to help you navigate through those questions and come up with actionable steps in order for you to live your best life. We've got to discover what we want. We've got to figure out a plan on how to get there and then we have to go. We can't just sit and wait any longer. Life won't wait on us. So come join me on this constant journey to become the best version of yourself and to find your best you. I'll see you on the other side. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I'm telling you, today is going to be an incredible interview, an incredible episode. Quite frankly, I have an incredible man with me. Uh, James uh, James Crumlin is, is with me here today, and James is a, a lawyer here in Nashville, yes, um, yes. specializing in a lot of different areas of law. I have a few written down here, labor and employment law, business and corporate law, uh, entertainment and media, and then litigation and dispute resolution. So a lot of the uh, jack of all trades in the lawyer business. Um, but what I'm really excited to get into today is, uh, you know, you're a huge racer. You do a lot of different Ironmans. You've done six regular Ironmans, yes. seven half Ironmans, yes. and then s how many regular marathons did you uh, say? Four. Four regular marathons, about 21, 22 half marathons, and however many 5Ks and 10Ks there are left, right? So yes, yes. a lot of, uh, very much an endurance athlete, a distance runner, a distance athlete. Um, so that's really cool. And I'm excited to dive a little bit more into the physical and the mental side of that. But the way I want to start today is give everybody a little bit of, of context in terms of really with your career, because a lot of people who are listening to this are, you know, trying to figure out what their passion is, what their career is, and where they want to take their next step. So I want to ask you about how you got into becoming a lawyer. Oh, thank you first. Thank you for having yeah. me here. I'm very excited to be here. This is a tremendous honor and treat to, to have <laughs> my my uh, an interview, my first podcast interview. I've always wanted to know how these things work. Yeah, and I really appreciate you having me here. Um, how I got into being a lawyer. So I was involved in a youth and government program in eighth grade. Um, and through that program, that exposed me to different areas of the law, different facets of how government worked. That coupled with the fact that my father was a lawyer, he was a civil rights attorney in Louisville, Kentucky, um, filed a lawsuit to desegregate the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville Dental Schools. And so that those two factors and my mother was an educator she was an elementary school teacher so there was always school when i got out of school at mm -hmm. home so uh all of that provided a perfect trifactor for me to go into the career of law okay cool awesome so sounds like your parents are both a <clears throat> huge influence on you yes. and probably taught you a lot of lessons your mom already, obviously being an educator maybe taught you a few more lessons than you really wanted yes, <laughs> at the time yes. um, but what do you think is the biggest lesson we'll start with your mom what do you think, what do you think is the biggest lesson that your mom taught you growing up to d always do your best hmm. in anything that you do never um do things halfway mm -hmm. if you're going to get involved in something or if you're going to take on a task always do your best mm -hmm. and uh, because it, at the end it's a representation of you it's a representation of your work ethic and you want to make sure that you have both of those on point while you're completing that particular task mm -hmm. um, so did she lead by example in that facet yeah, like what, what are some different she things did. that she would just do um, 100 so every time that uh, we would leave uh, to go to school or I would leave out to go and catch the bus to go to school there was always this this kind of rally pep talk hey do your best be the best uh, work twice as hard as the next person and that will always make sure that you're um, 
that you're that you've done the task well Mm -hmm. whether it's your schoolwork whether it's an after work activity i was involved in a number of different activities after after school so uh, from the the co-ed y to to national honor society to um what have you and she always said that whatever activities and whatever things that you decide to do just make sure that that you do your best that's awesome because i think um you know you you, i you always have to commit yourself fully to whatever it is that you're doing yeah. or else, like you said, you're never, the, the outcome is never going to be as great as it possibly could have been. Um, so talk a little bit about, we're going to just kind of stay on that idea of doing a lot of different things sure. and trying not to divert too much, not to spread yourself too thin. Yes. Cause you do, you do, you do a ton of things right now. Yes. Um, yes. but you're good at a lot of them. So tell, tell me a little bit more about how you prioritize the different things that you do currently. So some of the, things, the priorities, that's always, uh, that's always an interesting topic. So for me, I always like to look at what makes you feel good, mm-hmm. what gives you, what fuels your passion. Um, for me, it's always been the law. It's always been helping people out. So that's a perfect combination. Um, because through the law, you can help people out. You can help people out in the business aspect, in their personal lives, in their financial lives. It just really kind of depends on what their particular issue is. Mm-hmm. Um, on the personal side, on the, the fitness side, I've always you know, wanted people to, to, to be that, be their best, to be the best year. Yeah. And, uh, through whether it's, um, training for a half marathon, a 5k, 10k, or just, Get, just being active, uh, coming out to the capital steps or what have you, just that mindset of being active and actually f- uh, focusing on what makes you feel better. Mm-hmm. What can you do? It's all about self-fulfillment and as well as trying to help others mm-hmm. because you have to be in a position yourself to Fuel yourself to make sure that you're doing well before you can help others. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think it's really important that you talked about, you know, making sure that you're doing the things that you're passionate about yes. that give you energy. There's a quote that comes to mind immediately when I hear that, and it says, Don't ask what the world needs. Um, ask what makes you come alive and then go do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. That's right. And that, that's, that's exactly, exactly what you're talking about. You know, that's do it. the things that give you energy, do the things that you're passionate about. That's it. For cool. Sure. Um, and so your dad obviously was a lawyer, so it had to be a huge influence in you going into the, going into law as well. So what are the, some of the lessons you think that he taught you growing up? Oh my goodness. My dad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he taught a number of life lessons too. Um, you know, always uh, uh, make sure that you know, you always have on a suit and tie if you go into court or if you're out in, in public um, in a professional sense because that carries a different uh, a different air and people kind of treat you differently. Um, always make sure that you get your your education and all of your degrees and certifications in a particular field so that you can be an expert or have knowledge about what you're talking. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, that won't be an issue. Um, make sure that you that you have everything together, um, neat and organized. Yeah. Always have your arguments set. If you're going into the courtroom, you want to make sure that you have your three points and uh, make sure you make those three points succinctly and then have an opening and a closing and then, and then move on. Yeah. And, uh, he, sounds, he sounds like a very structured man, like yeah. very much like... Have your ducks in a row, like yes. prepare, be organized, yes. and be an expert at whatever it is yes. that you're going to go Absolutely, do. Absolutely, for sure. A lot of life lessons in that, and you know that just kind of um, helped me out along the way, especially throughout high school and college. So. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And in law school. Yeah. And now. <laughs> right, right. So you went to Vanderbilt. I did. And then you, st- you stayed here yeah. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of want to fast forward to 2003 when you ran your first marathon yes. or first half marathon yes yes um and you t- talk a little bit more about that decision sure. i know it was a little inspired by yeah. your mom's passing everything yes. like that so yes. i just want to talk a little bit more about that decision yeah. to run that first yeah. race yeah thank you nick so it was um it was one of those things where i'd never so i'd always been active in high school i think everybody was active in high school and college you you were active to the extent that you could be active if you weren't a uh, uh, collegiate athlete or on scholarship or what have you, but 
um, after in 2002, my mother passed, and so I made the decision that. How old were you at this time? I was 29 when she passed. Okay. So I made the decision to do the Country Music Half Marathon in 2003 in her honor. And so I um, trained for that and PR'd, of course, since it was my first one. <laughs> And uh, just did that mar- did that half marathon, and that at the time was probably the the most difficult thing physically that that I've done because you had to I had to think about on the days of man I really don't want to run. I had to think about my why. You know the why was you know hearing her voice saying you can do this, you got this, you can do this, keep pushing. You know all the things mm-hmm. that I tend to keep that I yell at the steps when people are, 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 are doing the workout. So that's where that comes from. If you, if you want to know, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, so just hearing that voice and, um, really believing that you could do it and having friends and family that came out and, and supported me, um, during that race that, that really provided the inspiration to do that. And so I did it that year. And then I did it every year, um, with the exception, I think of, 2010 because it was so hot that morning <laughs> and uh, I haven't done it I didn't do it this year because I did Ironman Texas but right. um, but I, I you know that's how it all got started it started as I wanted to do something and, and you know to honor her right so why so why race um, because there, because to race you have to have a lot of mental focus I mean if you've ever run a half marathon or done any type of um event, you have to have a certain type of uh, mental focus and to figure out why you're doing it, you know, what's your why, because there's going to come a point in the race or during training that you're going to say, man, I I just don't know. So you have to have that why lined up um, so that when you get to that point that you want to quit, you don't want to go as hard, you want to just walk away. Or you want to do something else mm-hmm. that you, you can always circle back to your why. Mm-hmm. You know? So obviously, like you said, it's a huge, not only physical test, but mental test. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to come back to that why, like you say, every single every single time that you have this these doubting moments. But what else is kind of going through your mind through a race? Because you can't, you can't necessarily just be focused on that why, the 100% the entire time. There's got to be other things going through your race sure. in terms of like how to... Um, keep my body going physically and on all those different sorts of things. So tell me a little bit more about the mental process during a race. So outside of it being hot, (laughs) if it's hot, that's usually what you're thinking. Oh my God, it's so hot. It's so hot. I need to cool down. But no, seriously, there there are a lot of different things that you think about during a race. So um, you always, in addition to your why, um, you you think about family. You think about um, re- religion. Um, I've had a number of talks with God mm-hmm. <laughs> during races, uh, especially during Ironman on the swim. He and I are really close mm-hmm. during the time that I'm in the water. We were close all the time, but especially close in the water. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, it, um, you just really have to focus on that and and and. Um, finding motivational reasons to keep going yeah, really. whether it's whether it's playing a song in your head or singing a hymn or singing a, a, a your favorite pop song or um, the, your inspirational quote or something mm-hmm. like that just something that can keep uh, keep you motivated because mm-hmm. at some point during the race you're on you're on autopilot because you've tra- if you've trained, and I always say that if you've trained properly, then the the race day should be a celebration mm-hmm. of your training outside of, you know, some elements like weather and terrain or what have you that you may not have encountered during training. But other than that, it should really just be a celebration of your training aspect. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So you talked about your your moments with God in the water. So what I want to transition to is so you started off with half marathons, right? Yes. It's your first race. And then you upped it to marathons. Yes. And then you upped it to Ironman. Yes. And when before you had to race your first Ironman, you didn't even know how to swim. Is that correct? I did not. So, I have no idea. <laughs> could not get across the pool. Right. So tell me a little bit about taking on learning something 
as, as basic, you know, as a lot of people already know, as as swimming at like mm-hmm. at an adult age. So talk about that process about going into something <laughs> fearful um, and something like learning how to swim. That that was probably um, the most fearful thing. That I always say that learning how to swim is probably. Um, uh, one of the top five hardest things that I had to do mm. in life. Right. So, what well, was uh, the toughest part about it? Kind of overcoming the initial fear, or just like uh, the initial fear of each practice, no, or was it like, was, am I ever going to get this? No, it was all mental because I'd almost drowned as a kid twice. Mm. So the first time um, I was at a pool, or whatever, and a uh, friend, uh, somebody who was at the pool, saved me or what have you. And then the next time my mother just happened to be in the pool with me. And so she saved me. And, you know, just having those mental blocks and barriers. And so when I first got in the pool, I didn't know how to swim. I had a, um, how this all started, uh, a good friend of mine, um, we had a, a nice, uh, friendly competition as to who could do the faster half marathon for the country music in 2013. Um, I ended up winning that and then so then we said okay well let's up the ante and let's go to 2014 and do the full marathon here and so I won that and then he said you know you and your you know that little marathon that we did you know, me and my, my friend here we do that after we do a 2.4 mile swim and after a 112 mile bike because uh, we're real men because we're iron men you know just guys just right. going around having a good time so I said, I'm in, you know, I, you know sure, why not? And uh, didn't know how to swim, couldn't get across the pool. Uh, I remember my, my first swim lesson, um, I was so nervous I couldn't even get the, uh, the swim tools and, and things out of the bag. Mm-hmm. And, uh, had a great swim coach, Ashley Whitney. Hey, Ashley, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and good friends and uh, Daryl, Taryn, and Steven that kind of helped me conquer those fears and you know we usually do the races together yeah and but that was tough i mean being actually actually figuring out how to swim and accomplish it wasn't actually the the physical part because we can all do it physically it's it's learning the how to get overcome the mental barriers mm-hmm. yeah was there like a turning point for you that there was like all of a sudden it was like I'm not as fearful of this anymore. Or like, what was kind of, you know, what got you over the hurdle of that first practice being so nervous, not being able to grab the swim gear to being to the point where like, okay, I think I have a grip on this now. Well, I don't know if I, I ever had a, uh, a grip on swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking with, um, uh, my, um, coach, uh, this past weekend in Texas. I said, you know what? This was the first time I just got in the water and just swam with no fear, mm-hmm. you know, because you always have some type of trepidation or some type of fear or something that's holding you back because there's you can swim in a pool all day. Mm-hmm. But when you get out in open water, it's 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 different. You can't if you're in a lake or a river, you put your head in, you can't see the bottom. You can't see anything. You barely see your hand going by on your swim stroke. And you have to trust that there are no fish, snakes or uh, depending on what part of the country, right. alligators swimming <laughs> next to you, or if you're in open water, you you, you sometimes encounter jellyfish or some yeah. other uh, nice uh, sea creatures that yeah. like to come and say hi. Or, but if you're in a big group, you know they're they're pretty much not coming around you. Yeah. But um, it it it's very it's it, it was very challenging and very difficult to to wrap your head around. Um, doing something totally new, stepping out the box, saying to yourself, um, I can do this. You know, I am not, I am not limited by my mental limitations. Mm-hmm. Do you think it was just kind of like repeating yourself over and over again that you finally began to believe that you could do it? Because I think a lot of people, yeah. you know, well, are trying to go into things that they are uncharted territories sure. or uncharted waters, sure. the pun. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> And so, like, do you think it's really just kind of believing in yourself, finally? I think that plus having a good support group. Mm. Because you have to have folks around you that really support you. Not the naysayers. Not the people that are going to doubt you. Oh, 
Nick, are you really going to do this? Mm. Now, somebody says, Nick, you know you can do it, and I know you can do it, and I'm here to help you any way that I can to make sure that you that you do it. Mm-hmm. And so having that core group of, of folks um, that have been through it, that know exactly what you're going through, uh, that always helps. I think having that core group of of people, it just has a support system in general. That's such a oh, lesson yeah. outside of yeah. outside of training for an Ironman, outside of learning yeah. how to swim. It's I mean, just like you need to surround yourself with positive people who are willing to support you. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a life lesson. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to have people in your corner. You know, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, so my uh, uh, one of my favorite athletes, if not my favorite athlete of all time, is Muhammad Ali. So I always think of things like in a boxing ring. So you know, when you're when you're out during the day, and I always equate like being out during the day is being when the bell rings and you go out in the middle of the ring and you fight, right? You're, you're dealing with all types of work issues. You're dealing with um, people issues. You're dealing with whatever that, that happens during your day. But at the end of the day, when the bell rings again and you go sit in your corner to rest, you don't want to have to deal with the same stuff that you're dealing with in the middle of the ring in your corner. Mm. So you need to have people in your corner that are supporting you, that are telling you, hey, um, you can do this. Or, and that's not to say they need to be people who always are yes people, but they need to be, they, they can also be ones to give you the brutal truth that says, hey, Nick, you know, I think that that's a great goal, but why don't we look at it this way? and give a nice spin to it, not negatively, but a constructive criticism and give a nice spin to it so that it can help you with life. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I I truly believe that you have to have people in your corner, people that support you. And if you don't have, if you don't have those people in your corner, don't have those people that support you, you need to get new people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Yeah, I think having people in your corner is really important. And like you touched on, you need people also who will give you the brutal, brutal truth because there is... Sometimes when you're around just friends and family, they'll say, you're good. Like, everything's awesome. You're doing great. That sort of thing. And it's like, great, but I need a little bit more feedback than that. So sure. um, we need, I think, some of our best friends are people who are willing to yeah. be courageous enough to give us that yes. tough feedback. Yes. Tough feedback. So I want you to kind of touch on the idea of how to respond to feedback that you're getting. To what, how to, like, filter whether or not I need to take this in. This is something that... I need to try to work on or try to learn on or like this person is just a doubter, this person is just a naysayer, I don't need to necessarily listen to them, I need to block that out. So kind of how, talk a little bit about that balance and how we evaluate which feedback to take in. So it's it's always interesting when people talk about feedback um, because per, people that give you feedback, you need to obviously respect them, respect their time, respect their mind, respect their energy. Because if they're taking the time to say, hey, Nick, I see you're doing it this way, but hmm, what do you think about this? Or, Nick, I've always been in your corner, but maybe we should take a different approach. And I don't think that you should be doing it this way. Um, it's it's all about you have to be you yourself have to be receptive to to feedback and you have to be willing to learn. Because you don't know everything. I don't know everything. I'm still learning day by day. Mm-hmm. And that's the great thing about, about life and interacting with people is because every person that you interact with, you can learn from that particular person. Mm-hmm. Um, so the people that give you the constructive feedback, the people that are in your corner, how to kind of differentiate from naysayers is if they're always, um, if they have your best interest and <clears throat> are sincere in the commitment for making sure that you are going to be a better you. Mm-hmm. If they are sincere, sincere and making sure that uh, you are going to do things safely and properly, whether it's swimming, biking, or running, or if they're a mentor of yours that has um, a vested interest in you, you always have to be willing to listen. You always have to be willing to, to take in some of the feedback. Um, you know, because a friend of mine always says hard work uh, beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. So mm-hmm. you, you you always have to make sure that you're taking that in and making sure that you're putting in the hard work and that person is helping you um, and giving you the feedback that you need to make sure that you're you can accomplish your goal. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think it's the I think the 
Where, where when you said that you need to make sure that they have your best interest in mind. Yes. I think that's like the biggest probably yes. takeaway that you need to realize. Like, is this person actually looking out for the best? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Looking out for my best me or are sure. they kind of more like self-interest kind of a thing? Right. Because we've all had those people that say that we've been around folks that say, Woo, I don't know, I, whoosh, I wouldn't do that. That's somebody that doesn't have your best interest. Yeah. Or they could, you know, it could be like they're jealous. Or they're jealous. But if they say to you, you know, Nick, hey, I see what you're doing. I think this is great. Um, Let's take a different approach. Mm -hmm. Or, and it's all about how they come at you. We always have people in our lives that that give you tough love. I have a friend of mine who helped me with my swimming. And, you know, he always was there uh, and he gave me tough love. And so, you know, during that time, you know, you needed that. And um, um, what's up, Taryn? And, uh, <laughs> it gave you that tough love. And so that was uh, that was something that was in. So you need to have people in, in your life that, that do that. Um, I've had mentors from uh, in business and in, in law uh, when I was growing up. I mean, you know, it, it takes a it takes a village really to make sure that somebody's successful Mm -hmm. and if you don't have the right people in your in your village then you know you you may not be as successful as you can be yeah i think when you said um like it's really important about how they come at you and how they actually communicate with you i think that's one of the biggest ways that we can start to discern whether or not like immediately when they almost like the way their facial expression the how they the terminology that they start to use it's like okay i can start to discern whether or not i'm going to be taking this in or how much i'm going to be actually taking it but i want to get into a little bit more of the the tacticals of of racing so you've done a lot of these races you know you just came from houston you've done it all over the the world now you've done it in france and in india right dubai uh dubai dubai is that uh, that not india no dubai is united arab emirates Ah, okay got it i need to look my geography (laughs) Well, actually, India, I think it's maybe three or four hours away by plane. Okay, gotcha. So you, but you've done it all over the world and all different types of environments, different settings. Sure. And so anytime you go there, everything is everything can be different. Food can be different. What are what are some of the things that you have to hold constant for yourself yeah. in order to make sure that you perform in all these different environments? So, uh, yes, there there's definitely things that have to be consistent. So, obviously, your nutrition that you take during the race. You want to make sure that you have the same nutrition during the race and that you practice it the same way uh, so that on race day, it'll be as close to flawless as possible. Um, So you want to pack your own nutrition. Of course, you want to bring your own bike uh, and, you know, cycling shoes and all your gear, all the gear that you've used. Food, that can be that can be tricky Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're in a different country or even if you're in a different state, you may not be able to get the the food that you normally are used to, like your pre race meal or your 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 meals two days out, or the right go to the right grocery store. Think about it: if you're in France, you've got to find the right market, or you go to Dubai, you've got to find the right store that can have the the different things that you hopefully can take. Because sometimes you can't you can't take that stuff with you; mm-hmm. it can't really pack you know perishable items. So you have to wait till you get there to get it. So. Um, all of that. So the nutrition has to be constant. Your gear has to be constant. And then really, when it gets down to it, it's mental. It's on race day. It's mm-hmm. like, are you going to, um, are you really going to set your mind to the task at hand and say, hey, look, you know, I've, this is a celebration. I have done all of this hard work. I have ridden hundreds and hundreds of miles. I've listened to James Crumlin tell me, over and over again, or Ashley Whitney tell me, or Todd Nordmeyer, you know, bike coach, or all these other folks tell you that you can do it. I've, I've ridden all these hundreds of miles with all these different people and swam all these miles, ran all these miles. Race day is time. Mm-hmm. It's time to bring all of that together and map out, <clears throat> get a game plan together and figure out how to execute the game plan so that you can have a really good race. So I think what I'm hearing is we're kind of regardless of terrain, regardless of where you are, you need to be able to bring your mental clarity and focus almost kind of back to the same spot no matter where you are. Yes. So I always say that, um, or at least I always recommend that, you know, before you start your race or what, always, what has always helped me is... Um, sitting in a room and just meditating 
getting some time, whether it's the night before the race or a couple of days before the race or a week before the race or whatever, and just sitting there and just closing your eyes and just meditating. Don't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just meditate and just focus on, okay, this is what this is going to look like. This is what that's going to look like. And then actually visualize what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. That way you can um, you can really kind of prepare yourself mentally. And then, of course, there's going to be some unknowns. There are always some unknowns. But if you focus on on you and your training and everything that you've done to prepare your nutrition and all that stuff, then you're going to have a, you're going to have a reasonable good race. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about a little bit before we got on about the different toughest terrains that you've yes. been been through. You know, we've touched on. Dubai, France, and, and Houston here. And before you told me that France might have been one of the hardest terrains because of the, the bike and yeah. the, the hilliness of, yes. of that. And you didn't finish it the first time. <clears throat> but you've also touched on how swimming has, you know, been such a hard part for you. You sure. had your, your God talks <laughs> in the water. So I'm, I'm interested if you go back to one, if there's any like one particular moment that was your toughest moment in a race that was like, I don't know if I'm going to mm -hmm. get through this. I'm hurting. Like, was there any one moment? in any race that you go back to as your Gosh. toughest moment? Toughest moment? I don't know if I can, there's so many. Okay. Uh, so I, I think of, um, I think of a 70.3 that I did right here in Chattanooga where on the swim, I um, had a bad swim practice. This was two years ago, 2016, had a bad swim practice. You swim 400 up, make a, make a turn around a buoy, and then you're down river. I couldn't get, I, I struggled to get the 400 up. I held on to, when I got to the top by the buoy, I was holding on to a Tennessee wildlife boat. <laughs> <laughs> the officer of the boat says, uh, hey, you want to come in? I said, no, I just want to hang out for a second. And so I looked at my watch, and I said, man, I got 30 minutes to get down river before the time cut off. And I said, well, let's go. And so that was probably a tough moment. Um, another tough moment was in France, um, the second time, which was this past summer. And I finished the race that time and I was very happy about that. But a tough moment was in the Alps. You know, we're climbing, we just finished our biggest climb and my uh, my special needs bag was gone. So my nutrition that I planned to have for the second part of the bike was gone. And so there was, Why? I don't know, somebody, I guess one of the volunteers had given it to somebody else because oh, no. they're all numbered. And I guess they had gotten mixed up or what have you, but that was gone. And so I was really like, oh boy, I was freaking out. Mm -hmm. And um, but I'll never forget her. This little French woman had me, she had a hoagie and she said, in, in French, I don't even know what she said. She just offered it to me. She tore off the bottom third, kept it for her, and then gave me two thirds for a sandwich. Oh. And so that was, I mean, that was my nutrition wow. for it. the second half of the bike was was a hoagie. I mean, I had some hydration stuff on my bike, but no, nothing, nothing substantive. So that 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 saved my my race um wow, what a blessing yeah yeah what a true blessing a true angel so and there's another race so um i think if i had to narrow it down those would probably be the two i mean there's so many instances on mm -hmm. the swim where you're swimming and you're like oh i just don't know <laughs> but you know you just kind of get through it and focus but uh yeah since this houston one was the was the latest one and fresh off your mind um, was there any like particular moments there that were particularly challenging or but what was your just biggest takeaway from the race then if not um you can do anything is my biggest takeaway we have why um no matter what adversity you go through uh, if you have the mental toughness and you have people that are supporting you then you can get through it and you can be successful uh so in Houston, there's so many different, in the Woodlands, there were so many different things that were interesting about race day. So you had, obviously, the weather. Uh, we, it was 90, 85, 90 degrees that day. We don't have that, those temperatures here. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to train for that, even though you can put on, you can put on layers while you're doing your run, while you're doing your bike, and try to, you know, try to duplicate or simulate the heat. But it's really hard to do. It's really hard to have, like, sun beating down on right. you for seven or eight hours or however many hours that you're on the on the bike and on the run 
But, um, you know, that, that can be tough. And, you know, you just have to really focus. And if you have some obstacles that come up, whether you're, you get dehydrated or your body starts to fail you, um, if you have those things, those mental things in your head of, I can, I can do this. And then if you have somebody there that can help you get through it, whether it's they're cheering for you in the crowd or they're actually on the course and they're walking with you or they're making sure that you're okay. I mean, those type of things are invaluable. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So you touched on a few times about how that one time you didn't even race because it was really hot. And you mm -hmm. talked about how it can be really hot during, uh, mm -hmm. during the races itself. But this is just even during the race, oh, you know, sure. before the races, all the training, oh, the yeah. training days, I'm sure there's plenty of days that you have to train when it's super hot and the conditions yes. aren't um, aren't ideal, that's for sure. Your early mornings, late evenings, I'm sure. So how do you really keep yourself motivated or how do you hold yourself accountable to following through with the promise that you, promises that you make to yourself that I'm going to train and then I'm going to keep doing this and I'm going to keep going? So it's always great if you have an accountability partner. If you have somebody that can train with you or um, a coach that holds you accountable um, by putting in your workouts and saying, hey, you didn't do this, Nick, on this day, mm -hmm. you know, or you were slow on this day, is everything okay? Uh, let's take a step back and really has your best interest and can kind of see and motivate and guide you on that. Um, but to really, it's all about time management when you're, when you're training, mm -hmm. you know, because you have a life and life is 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 jealous of you mm -hmm. dedicating all this time to training and all that stuff you know if you're you know my your job is very demanding my job is very demanding so there are times where i can't train you know there are times and, and initially i would freak out like oh my god i didn't do that bike ride oh my god i didn't do that run <laughs> i didn't do that swim my life is over no your life isn't over you just readjust your schedule to to fit to fit it in mm -hmm. and if it doesn't fit then it just doesn't fit that week okay um well so let's talk a little bit more tactically then about sure. time management sure. about habits and yeah. stuff do you keep a calendar do you yes. have like a daily list or how do you, how do you usually go about prioritizing your time management and all the different things that you're going to do. Yes. So uh, the 16th floor, which I refer to as uh, the 16th floor, is my job on McAllister North, uh, where I'm a lawyer. So that that takes precedent over everything, scheduling-wise. Um, obviously, if there are family needs or family emergencies, then that really takes precedent. But day-to-day -day basis, job takes precedent. I mean, because you got that's that's the engine that fuels everything else that allows me to do all the stuff that's the financial piece um so that takes precedent and, and then i have a i have an app that allows me to do uh, i put certain workouts in the app so i know how long it's going to take me to do a bike i know how long it's going to take me to do a run um so i'll plan my day after that weekends are usually longer they're longer training days because you have more free time and theoretically you don't have to work <laughs> unless you have a big project so yeah. um but that's that's really it it's all about time management about what what you can fit in that particular day and everybody has it everybody has time management issues because their job you know if you have a family your family your kids all of that you know pulls on your schedule and you know you if you're training for something you have to figure out a way to get it in and if you if life happens which i people always say um you know, i coach several people that they get really down and out about missing a day and i'm like well mm -hmm. let's life happen so let's move up move past that and let's do something different mm -hmm. obviously you like so obviously you like to train a, a lot i mean and you talked about meditation before your races but i'm wondering do you have any non-negotiable daily habits or maybe weekly habits that you have to get in in order to like kind of keep your sanity <laughs> uh maybe outside of like just training sure. or you know a regular job is there anything that you do that um, helps out non-negotiable daily habits of course obviously uh is prayer <laughs> okay that's uh, a huge factor for me um how long uh, uh man depends on the day mm -hmm. You know, I always you know, wake up thankful, go to bed thankful, and 
try to be thankful during the day and yeah. try to communicate that um, yeah. so that it, it, it can be tough. You know, if you're having a bad day, then sometimes you just close your office door and just you know, turn on some music and have your own church, in, so to speak, in your office. Right. Or you know, there have been days like that. Um, you know, that. So time with friends, that's also uh, non-negotiable. That uh, weekly Obviously, sometimes I can't get it in daily, daily right? but but weekly, I've got to have that because for me, uh, that is a source of grounding. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, uh, growing up as an only child, you know, my friends were like my brothers and sisters. So if you're in that quote unquote circle of friends or whatever, then, you know, we, we're all like brothers. We're all like sisters. So I, I really enjoy spending time with my folks mm-hmm. and I hope they enjoy spending time with me <laughs> I think uh, it's another thing is it gives you energy yeah you know, it's one of those things where anytime you have a good hang out with your friends good conversation with your friend you leave feeling energized and happy and, and yeah and there are when we get together it's just a ton of laughs and you know laughter fuels the soul mm-hmm. and so that that helps you so much it helps you kind of reset and recharge to be able to say, okay, you know, today wasn't so bad. Yeah. I can go out and do it again tomorrow. (laughs) So that's important. All right. So we're down to the last two questions that I always ask the, yeah, I always ask the same two to everybody. So the first one, I always start off by throwing out the age number. So how old are you currently? I am 46. 46. All right. Awesome. So 10 years down the road, you're going to be 56. So what does, (laughs) (laughs) not to scare you, uh, but it's the reality of the situation, right? (laughs) So, 56-year-old James Kremlin, what does that guy look like? What have you done? What have you accomplished? And what are you currently doing? Oh, my gosh. 56-year-old James Kremlin. Okay. Man, there's so much that 56-year-old James Kremlin would probably tell 46-year-old James Kremlin that I don't know yet. (laughs) But, you know, I'd I'd love to obviously continue practicing law, continue the... um, the health and fitness world, the different things that I'm doing there. Um, do you have any particular Ironmans that you know. know you want to go do? I want to do Kona, so I'm going to keep doing Ironmans until I get to 12. And then 12, there's a legacy program that after you've done 12, then you enter into a pool and oh, cool. they'll select you, hopefully. And you get to go and do Kona. So Kona is like the Boston Marathon of, of Ironman. So as Boston Marathon is to the marathon world, Kona is to the triathlon world. Mm -hmm. So I hope to do that. Um, You know, I have some personal goals, too. Uh, So hopefully those personal goals will will be fulfilled and just have a have a nice 56 year old life. I I hope to be. in enjoying life like I'm enjoying it now. So. Cool. Well, so I wasn't going to ask this, but uh, you, you sparked a thought in my head. Uh, you said a 56-year-old James Cameron would probably tell 46-year-old uh, some things that you don't know now. So what would what is forty what would 46-year-old James Cromlin tell 36-year-old James Cromlin? Oh, man. I don't think, I think we have to start the podcast over. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much. If you had to pick two things. Um, if I had to pick two things. Yeah. Uh, one would be, um, gosh. <laughs> You're like, how do I narrow it down? How do I narrow it down? I mean, there's so much. One would be definitely don't um, don't sweat the small stuff. I mean, there's so many different things that upset you on a daily basis that you think, oh, my gosh, my life is over. <laughs> And or you get mad at somebody for for something really small and um, you know just don't sweat the small stuff you know say hi to people even if they don't particularly care for you or mm-hmm. like you because it's not it's not your fault it's it's, it's their energy that's mm-hmm. messed up and you don't want to give in to their energy um, probably invest more Nashville has boomed in the last 10 years yeah. you know I'm sure everybody in Nashville wishes they had bought a piece, yeah. of, piece of property downtown so yeah. uh, probably do that but just uh, enjoy enjoy family time mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm very big on friends and family so I would tell myself to keep doing that um, 
things that I probably missed out on, you know, were, were probably because I didn't spend enough time with with friends and family. Mm. And so, uh, I think that's important to prioritize yeah. that. It's important to prioritize that. Well, so before the last question, uh, I want to acknowledge you, James, for giving back so much that you currently do um, in the community. You know, you've you struggle with uh, doing the swimming thing, and you know, you just jumped into the endurance racing world, and now you're you know you're giving back to the people who who are wanting to do that themselves, and to so many more people who are just trying to be better versions of themselves um, and, and trying to be more fit and you do so much outside of fitness that we weren't able to even touch on too um, that is definitely worth acknowledgement as well so um, that's awesome and I know people are going to want to learn more we should have touched more on the capital steps workout so yes. leave that for another yes. time but capital steps workout Monday and Thursday every 6 o'clock 6 yep. p.m. right Monday and Thursday 6 p.m. down at the capital steps um, love doing that that is open to everyone all skill levels all skill levels totally free um, it's a, a a very unique thing that that we've been able to offer here in Nashville mm-hmm. and it's totally free invite everybody to come out people of all skilled levels there's a lot of um, hills <laughs> uh, <laughs> steps of course uh, burpees body weight exercises push-ups crunches all this stuff mm-hmm. and you know, but you got those su- that support group oh, all the people in your man, corner there I mean the support I saw well, like last week or one of the last days you had 70 people out yeah. there and there's all I mean there's always a huge yeah. crew yeah so during the summers we'll range anywhere from 70 to over 100 mm-hmm. depending on uh, what happens we've been doing it seven years um, at the end of May we'll have our seven year anniversary our seven year celebration so be on the lookout for that type of stuff. Of yeah. course, you'll be invited, and everybody's invited <laughs> to come out. And uh, we're just so excited about it. It's it's really all about seeing people. And I get really energized. With this. Mm-hmm. It's all about seeing people accomplish things that they thought they couldn't do through fitness. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you're saying, you know, I just don't know if I can make it up that hill. Well, you know, that tells me that that's a mental block in other areas of your life that you say, well, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. And so if you're able to get up the hill or if you're able to do an Ironman, if you're able to do a triathlon, if you're able to do a half marathon, then there are certain mental blocks that you have gotten over through fitness that can translate into your personal life, Mm -hmm. that can translate into your uh, professional life. You know, maybe there's a, a project that you can never do. Maybe there's something for your a project for your kids or something for your wife or your husband that you thought you weren't able to to do you weren't able, not a good communicator mm-hmm. well maybe because you were able to do this one thing over here that translates into you know I can figure this out mm-hmm. I can become a better me I can become a better version of me so I really enjoy watching people um, hitting their targets, hitting their goals at the steps yeah, and watching the transformation. Um, we've had so many people, see, we got on another, another line here. <laughs> we've had so many people that have come out and transformed their, their entire lifestyle. You know, we've had someone who, um, doctor, or she had a, she had a heart attack at one point and her doctor said, you know, what, what have you been doing? And she had told her, told her doctor, Hey, I've been going to, this workout, et cetera, et cetera. And the doctor said, man, your heart is really strong. If you weren't going to that workout, you would have checked out of here. Mm-hmm. And so we've had cancer survivors come and, and do the workout and so many countless other um, health issues that, that come out. And just to see, of course, not everybody knows it, but they, you know, they, they feel comfortable sharing it with me and I don't break any confidences. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, it's, it's just amazing to see um, the the dedication and the talent. And then you can see the transformation on people's faces, you know, where you have somebody that looks at the hill and is like, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then either something clicks or somebody comes by them and says, hey, come on, let's go do this. Mm-hmm. Or, hey, I'm going I'm to go with you. And... Next thing you know, you have the, the mental fortitude and the, the strength to, to do it. And it's it's phenomenal to see. Yeah, you can tell how much you enjoy it and how much you're energized. Because literally when we started talking about it, your whole physiology changed. You get to the edge of your seat, your eyes widen, your face lights up. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Do you think, do you think I keep delaying off the last question, but sure. um, do you think that you get so energized by it because 
you saw the importance of it in your own life, being able to do something that maybe you didn't think that you were able to do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I didn't think that I would be able to do that first half marathon. Mm -hmm. I mean, back in 2003, I was probably 25, 30 pounds heavier than I am now. Wow. And, you know, wasn't in the best of shape mm -hmm. and you know, ate anything that I wanted and had a really good time doing it. And, um, just to have that transformation to be able to do that and then to see that same type of energy and same type of transformation happen in front of me with you know, the 100 people or 70 people, excuse me, or whoever comes out, it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, it's all about them. I, you know, I don't, I don't do this for pay. I don't do it for self gratification or anything. I, I just really like pouring into people and making sure that they're they're that they're the best. Yeah. That's super cool, dude. So people can find you on Instagram yeah. at James Crum is there an underscore? No. No. Okay, just at James yeah. Crumlin. Yep, at James Crumlin. At J A M E S C R U M L I N. Okay, cool. And then there's a hashtag capital steps workout. Awesome. Very yeah. good. That's it. Well the last question I always ask oh, everybody. Yeah. Um, I always say that everybody, I think, is on the constant journey of becoming the best version of ourselves. Sure. I don't think we're ever at that person. Hopefully, on our last day, we can take our final breath. Yes. Hoping that we got close enough to that best version of ourselves. But I also feel like it's a very unique journey. Like, I feel like the best, when I, the way that I'm going to get to the best version of myself is going to be different than the way that you get to be the best version of yourself because we have different passions, we have different talents, and we need to find those things that light us up yeah. or that make us come alive, yeah, that give sure. us energy and magnify those things. So what I want to ask for you personally is if you could do or work on three things to get closer to the best version of yourself, what are three things that you could currently do or three things that you could currently work on? Currently work on three things. Um, continue my spiritual relationship with God. Um, continue... Um, Investing in time and family and friends, because um, tomorrow's never promised. Mm. Uh, and then three, work on my craft. Whether my craft is being a, a better lawyer, which I've always wanted to be, whether it's being a better triathlete, which I, I always want to be, uh, being a better triathlon coach, run coach, um, being a better version of me. I mean, I just, I just want to continue to, to work and be able to receive constructive criticism from family and friends so that I can take those thoughts and realize that those people are in my corner. And so they can help me. Um, and hopefully I can be that person in their time of need as well. Mm. Well, that's awesome, dude. Yes. Great things. Yeah. Uh, well, that's all we got today. I appreciate it, James. Okay. Hey, man. Thank you, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it was awesome. Loved it.